this, the senses are so strong and impetuous that uh, Krishna says, yes, and even a man with intelligence who tries to control his senses, many times is over, overcome by the mind. It, it's very difficult. That, uh, but Krishna says in the next verse, Tani Savani Samyamya Yukta Ashita Matpara when you restrain his senses, keeping them under full control and fixes his consciousness upon me, is known as a man of steady intelligence. That, uh, so that means that yes, we fix our consciousness on Krishna and his service, then Krishna says, yes, then you get intelligence, you become free from lust. That, uh, that will be explained in the third chapter. Our, our intelligence, our spiritual intelligence is covered by lust. Avitam jhanam etena jhanina nitya varina. It's covered by lust. Lust makes us, if you have lust in the mind and the intelligence, that makes you identify with the body. And it identifying with the body, what will you do? You will act out of attachment and aversions. That's acting as the body. Your attachment means you want, yeah. attachment means that, yes, you want or you desire what gives pleasure to the body and the mind, temporary pleasure. That, uh, an aversion means you don't want a distress. That, uh, and if we become under the control of this attachment and aversion, our lives become miserable. That, and how do you become under control of this attachment and aversion? That process in which we are all experts in this world is explained in the next two verses. How do we become attached to things? How to, uh, how, where do all these desires come from, from to enjoy temporary things in this world, which give, gives pleasure to temporary bodies just for a few moments? And we are not a body. That, and that's very interesting. You try to give pleasure to something which you are not. That, that, that it's insanity. And in the, in, in, in this, instead of pleasure, you get some pleasure, but then a lot of distress. It starts with Dayato Vishyapam San Sangha Stesi Vachayati Sangha Sangha Tekama Kama Koda Vijayate. By contemplating the object of the senses, a person develops attachment for them. And for such attachment, lust develops. And from lust, anger arises. And, what, and then anger comes. Koda Bhavati Sama Sama Smita Vipra Smita Brim Sabadunya Subunasa Panasati. From anger, complete delusion arises, and from the loose bewildering of memory. When memory is bewildered, intelligence is lost, and when intelligence is lost, one falls down in the material pool. What does that mean? We are like a fish in the water. A fish is in the water, and the fish, and there is also a fisherman. He puts out his, his fish's line and puts his line 
into the water. Hmm? And at the end of the fishing line, there is a bat, a worm, which is in the water. And now the fish comes and sees the bat and thinks, now I'm going to enjoy. And it comes closer and closer. And it then, then it thinks it's going to enjoy and it, it takes the bat. At that moment, the fisherman pulls up the line, hooks the fish and takes the fish of the line then cuts his open, the fish open, the inside out, and put the fish on the frying pan. And that's happening with us. We want to enjoy in this world. And we become fright, frustrated. It never happens what the mind tells us. The enjoyment that comes is very flickering. That, uh, so if we want spiritual life, we must learn to be satisfied with which whatever comes our way. That uh, I was just studying it today, the sixth canto of the Srimad Bhagavatam. And there we know that Vamandev is going to Vamandev is going to bash three pieces of land. Three pieces of land from Bali Maharaj. And Bali Maharaj told Vamandev, who was in a, the, the Supreme Lord in, in the form of a little dwarf, and he said, you are only asking three pieces of land. I am in charge of the whole universe. You are still a young boy. You are not very intelligent. Why, why are you not asking something more significant? I can give you everything. I can give you a village. I can, that I can give you a wife. I can, whatever you desire, you can ask. And then Lord Vamadev, he replies. And that's very interesting what he says. It is, the, it is very true. He's a Supreme Lord. And he gives a few instructions in a few lines that may help us not to fall in this trap which is described here in Bhagavad Gita. You meditate on something and then lust develops and then you run after it, you want to enjoy. And when you want to enjoy, the enjoyment is not as expected. You get frustration and, you, and, and, and the frustration is so heavy that you, be, you become you, you, you become angry. I mean, you become angry, you, use, you lose completely, completely your intelligence. Have you ever tried to, uh, have you ever tried to explain something who, to someone who is really angry? Good luck. But instead of wanting to fulfill all these desires in this world, Lord Vamadev said, one should be satisfied with, with whatever he achieves by his previous destiny. For discontent can never bring happiness. Discontent cannot never bring happiness. A person who is not self-controlled will not be happy even with possessing the three worlds. He will never be happy, he says. Text 25. Material existence causes discontent in regard to fulfilling one's lusty desires and achieving more and more money. This is the cause for the continuation of material life. 
which is full of repeated birth and death, but when we satisfied by which is obtained by destiny, is fit for liberation from this material existence. Now, let's look a little closer is what uh, Ramon Dev say, is saying here. It's giving very wise and practical words. It is not that our that increasing our capacity to exploit the material energy will bring us satisfaction and happiness. No, it brings the contrary. The more we try to satisfy our desires, the more the list of all our desires multiplies. If I'm happy with what I have, I will not be happy with what I don't have, even if it is everything. If I'm not happy with what I have now, I will not be happy with what I don't have, even if it's everything. Raman Dev is talking about the mode of passion, passion or desires that passion or desires they cause hap they rather than causing happiness, they cause distress. Krishna says that in 522 of Bhagavad Gita, Yesan Spasyabuga, Dukayonya Evate, Atyantavante Kante Ya, Nati Suramati Buddha. The wise have said, Krishna says, that those who want to enjoy things in this world for their body and their mind. They get suffering, the opposite what they desire. And the wise says, don't try it. That uh, it's flickering, it's not worthwhile. That uh, so the attempt to fulfill our desires in this world causes distress. And that's also explained, explained here in this first how it causes distress. You become ang angry, frustrated, angry, you lose your intelligence. Therefore, the description is given here, the simp simple living and high thinking. To get satisfaction, one must live simple and think high. Srimad Vartam, 11 to 10, Kamasya Nandriya Priti Lavajivi Tijavata Sivasya Tatvasishna Sya Nartiyas Aha Karma Bi. Life's desire should never be directed to our sense gratification. One should desire only a healthy life or self preservation, since a human being is meant for inquiry of the absolute truth. That's our business that uh, lives simple, just to keep body and soul together, that and engage in Krishna conscious activities, hearing about Krishna, that, uh, that associating with devotees, that uh, so Srila Prabhupada makes this here also, that point in the Bhagavatam, in the purport. The Krishna consciousness movement is meant to make people happy, he's saying. That not, not a kind of happiness that, uh, that only if, if I had this, then I'll be happy. It never works on the material level. If I have something, then the desire, if I obtain something, then I want something else. The desire shifts. And that's the very nature of our mind. Therefore, all that advertising in this world that is meant to get 
people meditate on it and then lust develops and they want to fulfill it that uh, they 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 want uh, to fulfill our consciousness with so many desires and that's the way of our contemporary civilization it causes so much distress so much discontent, content so much dissatisfaction so much protest so much killing and so much crime so much intoxication because happiness is being conceived as coming from the mode of passion passion means the desire to fulfill yeah yeah fulfill the, the, to fulfill the the craving of my senses for enjoyment and the mind for enjoyment that uh, Lord Krishna says that content and satisfaction is born of the mode of goodness. That, um, but this, this is a specific quality of the mode of goodness. It brings contentment and it brings happiness. But who thinks like that in this world? Shilapapa told the story of a Brahman. A Brahman, and he was a teacher, he had his own school. That uh, I think it was in Krishna Nagar, Bengal. He was very learned, he was brilliant, he was simple, this teacher. He was pure, he lived with whatever the students brought him. Whatever it was, he was satisfied with it. So the king found out of this pure soul and he went to him and said, and said to the Brahman, you are living in such, a, in such poverty. Such a person like you does not need to live in such a type of poverty, but what do you want? And I'll get it for you. He said, the Brahman said, I don't need anything. The, the, my students come and they bring me some rice every day. And I have a tamarind tree and I take a few leaves and then I boil it with the rice. And that's all right, I'm happy. It's a complete different concept. It cannot be imitated by us. Just but just whatever you have, be grateful for it. That is the attitude, we call it the attitude of gratitude. Attitude of gratitude. Being thankful for whatever you have, rather than being this disgruntled or discontent. If you are happy with what you have, then you are happy. If you are not happy with what you have, you will not going to be happy with, with whatever you have. That, uh, how much money you need to have to feel, to feel yourself secure. If one is satisfied by that which is obtained by destiny, one is fit for liberation, Dev says here as it brings the mode of goodness. The goodness means one is peaceful. And when one is peaceful, one can fix one's mind on Krishna and go beyond the world. So when one is peaceful, is at a doorway of knowledge. That, uh, so being satisfied, whatever we receive by providence, and then try to get transcendental happiness. That, uh, so the, in the provisional service, we are not concerned with, giving, with making 
our own senses and, and mind happy? No, we are concerned with serving Krishna's spiritual senses and not our petty desires. That if we go after our petty material desires, it brings dissatisfaction, discontent. There are so many people in the third world countries and they want to go to the first world countries, especially the, the United States of America, because they are poor and they're thinking that their poverty is the cause of their unhappiness. But are the people in first world countries, are they satisfied? Are they happy? This is a deep ignorance that I remember in at the end of the 90s, 30 days I was doing Parikram. We, we walked in Praj Mandal, the area around Vrindavan. And every day we, we were staying in another village. And in this village, villages, there is no electricity. There is, there is a few farmers living there. They have one tractor and they have cows. That, but when, when we come through these villages, all these people come out, out of their houses. They offer rotis, chapatis, or, or some milk. And they're all smiling. <laughs> you can see they are happy. Especially where there is no electricity. Of course, nowadays, everyone has mobile phones. It works everywhere. That's not so good. That, uh, so, so these are important lessons to learn if we want spiritual life that uh, don't fall into this trap. Don't meditate on things in this world for enjoyment. Then you're getting problems that uh, because that, discon that disconnects you from, it, from your relationship with Krishna. It focus makes you identify with the body and it, it makes you identify with the mind, with the senses. So we must be connected with Krishna, otherwise we will connect, be connected with the material energy. Therefore Krishna says in the next verse, Nasti buddhya yuktasya, nas yuktasya bhavana, nas bhavayata santya asantasya kuta sukam. When we is not connected with the Supreme in Krishna consciousness, can ever neither transcendental intelligence nor a steady mind without which there is no possibility of peace. How can there be any happiness without peace? So Krishna stresses, we should control our senses, our mind and senses, and not let them meditate on things for selfish enjoyment. And it's not easy, Krishna says in the next verse, as a strong wind sweeps away a boat on the water, even a man of uh, one of the roaming senses on which the mind focuses can carry away a man's intelligence. That means this dayate visayapum sam, this meditation on sense objects. If you if you let your mind meditate on things and then you you will develop a desire to obtain it and then the mind who has this lust filled with lust to enjoy that thing will misuse the intelligence to obtain it that uh, and finally, it leads all to frustration. It's just, 
it makes you so um, disturbed the mind that it's like the mind has its many brands from so many things. Someone is driving a car and he wants to hear music at the same time and he's talking with someone to the phone, he's driving, he must give attention to the traffic and at the same time he's eating something. So all these senses are engaged. It's so disturbing <laughs> that trying to, to, to satisfy all the senses <laughs> and desires that uh, no peace and when there is no peace, Krishna says, no happiness. The first condition for happiness is being peaceful. That, uh, yes. As a strong wind sweeps away a boat on the water. That uh, even one of the roaming senses, Srila Prabhupada says, roaming senses. The senses are always that it's this like antennas they are searching for sense gratification that uh, what can i enjoy that but we should control that that uh, we should restrain the mind and the senses from meditating on things, things for enjoyment, for exploitation. That, and that restraining of the senses, we'll explain in the next verse. Tasma yasya mahabha o nihitani sarvasa indiyart indiyarte vyas tasya pakha pratishtita. Therefore, mighty armed, arm, uh, or mighty armed, one whose senses are restrained from their objects, is solely of steady intelligence. But now in the next verse, and that's very interesting, a devotee wants to control his senses. So he's going to live in a mode of goodness. So the program Srila Prabhupada gives us is in a mode of goodness. We get that up in the morning, we take a shower, we take a shower, and then to that is goodness, feeling clean, and then cleanliness, cleanliness in the mind, cleanliness, cleanliness within com, comes by chanting Hare Krishna. That and then attending Mount Mangala Arti, then chanting Japa, then hearing about Krishna. Worship of the Guru, that all the senses during this time are engaged in service. No time for sense gratification. And that's the mode of goodness that we go early to bed and early rise. That, so that's the mode of goodness. The vote is living the mode of goodness. And we are very different from other persons. And that's what Krishna says in the next verse. Yanisha Sarva Bhutanam Tasyam Chakarti Samyani Yasyam Chakarti Bhutani Shanisha Pashatomune to 69. But this nightfall beings is the time of awakening for self-control, for the self-controlled. And the time of awakening of all beings is night for the introspective sage. So the What's night for the, the common people is the, is the beginning of the day for the introspective sage. And what's the day for the introspective sage or the devotee is night for, the, for, for, for those, well, for all beings, etc. I remember this is the beginning of the 90s. At that time, I was in Ghent in Flanders, and we had a Namhata center there. And I was staying there sometimes in the, in the ashram. I was staying there with Bakhtapol. And uh, we were 
both neophytes, beginners in spiritual life, that we were getting up at four o'clock to, to take a shower and, and attend Mangala Arti. And we are in the, in, we, we, it was summer in the, in the middle of the city. And it was hot outside, so four o'clock, we got up and we, we opened the windows of the ashram. And we looked outside. And at the other side, there was a nightclub. We opened the windows and they opened, they opened the door. And we saw at the other side, they opened the door of the nightclub. And first a lot of smoke came out. And then after that, some, some people came out who were not walking too straight. <laughs> so for them, they were going to sleep. And we, we were getting up. It's a complete different lifestyle. Those in the those in the good goodness, they get up in the morning early. It's peaceful for practicing practicing spiritual life. That uh, and the night they avoid. That uh, they sleep or they are busy with 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 service, but no, that uh, it's a completely different lifestyle. But now the following verse, and we go to the near to the end of the second chapter, and that's a very important verse that follows now. Because the point is to how to control the mind. This is going to tell us how we need to do that. So this is very important. So I will be a little verse and then explain. Apo yamalam achala patishtam samudana pa proficiente serve. Tat pat kamayam proficiente serve is a santim of no jinakami kami. A person who is not disturbed by the incessant flow of desires that enters like rivers into the ocean, which is ever filled, but is always still, can alone achieve, achieve peace, and not a man who strives to satisfy such desires. So, like you have a river in the ocean, many rivers come into the ocean with great force, but the ocean is not disturbed by it. So desires may pop in, into our mind, but a devotee is not disturbed by it. That, uh, because a devotee has understood that he is not the mind, and I'm not the desires in my mind. Most people in this world, they identify with, with the mind. The function of the mind is thinking, feeling, and willing. And they think, that's me. I think I, I am. There's one philosopher who say, says that. that uh, but of course, in our original state as a spirit soul, we have our own thinking, feeling, and willing on the spiritual platform. But we, because we have tried, we have tried to exploit the material world, to, 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 to become ourselves the controller and the pop writer, but it's not our position. That, uh, yes, we have, we needed to accept this material body and this subtle body of mind, intelligence, false ego. So we have accepted this material body and this subtle body and our thinking, feeling and willing, which of the original spirit soul is taken over by the subtle material body. So, but we are not the mind. 
if you think you are the mind, it's a problem. Because what's the proof that we are not the mind? The soul, we can control the mind with our intelligence. If you are the mind, you cannot control your mind. If you control the mind, your mind, then the question is, what is controlling your mind? It's the soul who directs the intelligence to control the mind. That proves that we are not the mind. That. But if you think you are the mind, then the, the desires that pop up in you to your mind, you think these are my desires. And you catch these desires and you run after them with great force, trying to fulfill these desires. And there you go, diet of you meditate, less comes in your mind, and frustration because you don't get what you want, and it's revolt and that. But the question is, this desires in our mind, where does it come from? Desires can come from different sources. Can, they can come from the spirit soul directly. Yeah. That's, that's one, one way. Uh, I want to ask about the day. Do you want to do it tomorrow? Yes. Okay. If I will yeah. wake up early, I will wake up early. Okay. Yeah. I will not wake up early. I'm not missing. So, so the, the, the point is that we, the desires come up into the mind. Where do they come from? Three sources. They can come from the spirit soul. That uh, or they can pop pop up in the mind. Where do they come from? What's the source of these desires that pop up in our mind? Who puts them there? It's Krishna in your heart as Paramatma. He knows in your previous lives you had many, many material desires. And what's the characteristic of a material desire? The characteristics of my material desire is that you cannot fulfill this desire that we just have explained. It leads to frustration, anger, and so on. It's never fulfilled. And you see, uh, people, what do they need to feel secure? They want more and more. One, uh, one, one has one million uh, dollar or euro. And if you ask these people, what, what do you want? They want more and more and more because they don't feel secure. It's without end. It just leads to misery. That, uh, but they remain unfulfilled, these desires. They, that's the characteristic of a desire in this world. But your desires, it can never be fulfilled. And then you die and and all these unfulfilled desires, they are still in your subtle body. And Krishna knows that. He knows all your mind, all what you desired in your past life. We don't know anymore. And Krishna, not all at the same time, but it takes one desire of your subconsciousness from your previous life and pops up in your mind. Now you can have two reactions. A devotee is the observer of his mind. He does not I think I'm the mind. He observes the mind. And he looks at his desire and says, oh, that's a material desire. Krishna in Bhagavad Gita says, if I try to, to fulfill that, mis that desire, I will suffer. So I'm not interested. So it's not disturbed by these desires. They come up into his mind. And it does not run after them. It does not identify with them. And they go away. And it remains peaceful. That. But the person who identifies with the mind, they think this is my desire. And he, he thinks, yes, that's a good idea. idea. This time, it will work. This time I will become happy. 
and he runs after it. But it never happens. And we can try life after life after life. But therefore, Krishna says in the next verse, Piyaya kamanya sarvan puman shranti nishpriya nirmamani rankara sasanti madhikatsati. A person who has given, given, given up all desires of sense gratification, who lives free from desires, who have given up all sense of proprietorship and is devoid, devoid of false ego, he alone can attain real peace. Krishna says, you have to do two things here to, to attain this peace. Don't think yourself the proprietor. You can say, this is mine. Yes, it's, it's yours as long as you have the body. If you get 100 years of age, then you have lived for about 30,000 days. You get it maximum for 30,000 days. You can say I'm proprietor, but then so it's all temporary and life is flickering. Day and day it moves up like anything. We go quickly to the end. That uh, the proprietor is Krishna of everything, not us. That's just an illusion. And we are not an enjoyer. You can enjoy something when you are the proprietor, but the proprietor is God, not us. Therefore, we serve Krishna to give him enjoyment. And that connects us with the source of all bliss, ecstasy. But to feel that ecstasy, you must give up the lower enjoyment. The soul wants love and to be loved. And that love is fully experienced in his purity if we serve Krishna. Only, uh, we act only for his pleasure, not for anything for us. We only give out of love to please the beloved, and the beloved is Krishna. And then Krishna, from within the heart, gives you this feeling of love which is so beautiful. And it's an, it's an ecstasy, it's, it's a happiness, which is near, not in this world. This kind of happiness is described in the sixth chapter that it's called Samadhi. One's mind is completely restrained from mental activities. Yeah, this is character, characterized by one's ability to see the self by the pure mind. Then you see your, see your real spiritual form and you relish and rejoice in itself. In that joyous state, one is situated in boundless transcendental happiness, realized the transcendental senses, established thus while never departs from the truth. And upon gaining this, it thinks there is no greater gain being situated in such a position, one is never shaken, even in the midst of greatest difficulty. This is indeed actual freedom from miseries arising from material contact. That's the higher happiness which we can get by developing Krishna consciousness. Therefore, Krishna concludes this chapter. Esha Bhamasita Pakta Nainam Papya Vimuchati Stit Vasyamantakale Pi Brahmani Panam Ritsati. This is the way of the spiritual and godly life after attaining which a man is not bewildered. If one is thus situated, even at the hour of death, he can enter into the kingdom of God. Then, if our heart is pure, no material desires anymore, only the desire to serve Krishna and his devotees is permanent, then we are ready to develop this love. And when you have developed this love, you can go back to the spiritual world. That's the price to be paid. That, uh, so <clears throat> we are at the end of the second chapter and at the end of the seminar. Are there any questions? Hmm. 
So uh, I hope this was useful for you. <clears throat> During the next two weeks, I'll be teaching the Bhakti Bhagavata course for the Mayapur Institute. And uh, that is very intense because uh, we are following the Indian times. I'm in Bulgaria and uh, I have to get up here at three o'clock in the morning to uh, show this at three o'clock in the morning to present this course for four or five hours. So I have to, to go to bed early. So until the end of the year, I will not be able to continue the Friday evening, uh, the evening programs. But from January onwards on Sunday, 9 a.m. Uh, UK time or 10 a.m. in Brussels that uh, or uh, yes it will be two hours later it will be three hours later 1 p.m. probably for Mauritius and very early morning for Montreal that uh, I will present uh, summaries of the first count of the Shiman Bhagavatam. Every week on Sunday, one hour, I will present a summary, a summary of the first count of the Bhagavatam. And I think that will be interesting to, because the, the Shilapo part, he, uh, Yes, he uh, put everything in the first canto practically. That uh, so many he refers to Bhagavad Gita to comment commentators so it's just as Shila Vishwanath Sak Sakavakti Thakur Jiva Goswami, and uh, it contains the basic principles of spiritual life. So it will be interesting. I think John wants to ask a question. Yes, please speak. Uh, yes, Pranam uh, is back to Pranam Swami Maharaj. Um, Hare Krishna. Um, yeah, I'm not sure how much this so relates to what you've said so far, which has been, uh, yeah, thank you very much for that uh, enlightening. Um, so my question, uh, I'll just read what I wrote, um, is why is the word demigod used in the Bhagavad Gita? As this has become very confusing and a part or point of rejection when sharing with Christian friends, as the English understanding of demigod is an offspring of the fallen angels that had sex with human women, essentially meaning a demigod is the result of sexual union of an Asura, a demon, and a woman. My feeling is that angel would be a more appropriate word to describe the Devatas, who are servants of the one and only God, Krishna. As I speak to many, when they hear the word gods or demigods, I can see the fear and rejection in their faces. I now realize there is a very deep unconscious psychological fear programmed into Westerners that even if they do not follow their Western Abrahamic traditions, they have a strong aversion to the devil, Satan, fallen angels, demons, gods, demigods. So as to framing the Devatas as demigods, this does the greatest injustice to the Devatas themselves and their source Krishna in that there is only one God Krishna and that all other so-called gods are either devatas, angels, servants of Krishna or asuras, demons, fallen angels, demigods. English suggested equivalent would only distort the Sanskrit meaning or do more harm than good, misleading, irrelevant and toxic English words. That have twisted and distorted all translations. 
so to identify, correct, and remove all the colonial and distorting terms which were intentionally used to diminish and subvert the liberating truths of the Bhagavad Gita. I have now been using the term angel for devatas, and the response is remarkably different in a more positive sense, as they can relate to only one God and angels as servants of God. Thank you, Prabhu. Yes, the, the Sanskrit word is devas, the devas. Uh, the, the devas, instead of going to this, ang in this, uh, in the, into this language thing, it's better to, uh, it's better to explain what they are that may clarify. The word angel is not appropriate for the devas because there is a specific deva which is called angel or the apsaras. They are angels. And that is, or, or, or apsaras or gandharvas, that uh, those appear some, sometimes in, in this world. We find them also in the Bible, the angels or the gandharvas with uh, their wings and they are, they have mystic powers also. They are subtle living beings. Uh, devas, they are jivas like us, spirit souls. That, uh, but they are endowed with a certain power by the Supreme Lord, by God. They are like, they are ministers in the universal household. That, uh, and that is a, a concept which is not found in Christianity. And they cannot understand these things. Like you have the Deva for the water department in the universe, it's called Varuna. And Varuna, Varuna has a subtle form, but uh, at the same time, is also all pervading in the universe because everywhere where there is water, there is Varuna. It's something which is going beyond our capacity to comprehend. But they are very, very powerful. There are three, three, 33 million demigods in this universe that uh, some are hope. Oh, uh, higher devas, lower devas, that uh, you have the Kinaras that are like Superman, you have the, the Siddhas who are, who are yogic perfections, that uh, you have so many, so, so this word demigod or deva, it's, it's uh, a collection, it's is a collection of many kinds of, of beings. But they are all described in the Srimad Bhagavatam. That, uh, but in Hinduism, if uh, the, it's something I also don't agree with, but uh, of course in, Hindu, in Hinduism, the many Western scholars they speak not about demigods, they speak about the gods, the gods, but it's also very confusing. Mm. But in, in the Vedas, we will see, yes, all these gods are there, but they are also worshipping Lord Vishnu, the wish Krishna. That, that, uh, so all, but all these devas, they are mortal. They will die. They are temporary living beings. And they are in charge of the universe in so many ways. But they are not pure in mind. They have a purpose. They want to control. But they are very religious. 
they are serving God also to control. So that's not the purity which is required for spiritual life. So if we become pure, we become on, our consciousness becomes higher than their consciousness. That, but they are also serving the Supreme Lord. So if we become devotees, they will help us. Because they are also devotees of the Lord. And that's very interesting. But to, to, ex, to explain that to Christians, good luck, it's, it's too foreign for their concepts. It's not going to work. It's very difficult. And you speak about this challenge, and I, I appreciate that. that, that uh, and the, the word cho choice of Srila Prabhupada, yes, demigods may, may not be the, the right word, but there is no other word really available. That, because angel, angel, angels, they are, they, they, they are uh, uh, a certain type of demigod that that and, and you cannot the name of a certain type use that to 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 uh, define all the demigods the the gandharvas the apsaras they are very different that's beautiful beautiful uh, living beings that uh, this Gandhara was. But you, you have many others. Because you have different planets. That uh, we have seven higher planetary systems in the universe. That uh, because you have also higher than the demigods. You have Jana Loka, Tapa Loka, Satya Loka. That uh, Satya Loka is where Brahma lives, the creator. He has a different body. The demigods have subtle body, but he has uh, a causal body made of intelligence. is finer, much finer, finer than the bodies of the... And, and, and the more finer your body is, the more powerful and the most powerful body is the spiritual body. And we have that spiritual body, but it's covered now, as Srila Prabhupada says, by a gross and subtle body. We have just to uncover it. That, uh, yes. Yes, it's difficult to preach with uh, to Christians, but it's not impossible, because I'm also a Christian. I never gave up my Christian belief. Nobody can say, has the right to say that I'm not a Christian anymore. That's foolishness. So if you speak about the Christian, I'm also a Christian. That uh, we have also to consider that Krishna consciousness is not a belief. It's a science of the soul. And Srila Prabhupada said, we don't, we don't need to change our belief. I, I read the Bible. I knew, knew it because I was a very religious Christian. I studied the Bible. And uh, then I read Bhagavad Gita. I came in contact with the devotees. And after studying Bhagavad Gita, I read again the New Testament. And I could see Jesus Christ says the same thing, the same principles as Bhagavad Gita. You can understand the words of Jesus Christ perfectly to the knowledge of Bhagavad Gita. But to, to understand that first, you have deeply to know Bhagavad Gita. Anyway, I hope this helps. Uh, John, is that okay? Very helpful, Maharaj. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. Yes, thank you. Okay, thank you. So I'm looking forward to see you all online. If you want, next year I will keep you informed. And uh, also, yeah, the South 
London uh, WhatsApp group. You will be informed. Thank you very much. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna.